Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third session in our new Tips and Tricks series, Five Things to Do with MITRE Attack with David Liu. I'm Liz Fox, Marketing Events Manager at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of today's event. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You'll notice there are several widgets at the bottom of the screen. Here you can engage with fellow participants via the group chat, access resources, and submit questions for our Q&A section. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. Our speaker will remain on the line to answer questions at the conclusion of the webinar, so please make sure to commit, submit your questions via the Q&A widget. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand webcast at the conclusion of the webinar. So now, let's get on with the event. Today's speaker, David Liu, splits his time as a security researcher at Tripwire and a computer science instructor at Portland State University. Previously, he was an academic philosopher and still works on philosophy in his spare time. So now, without further delay, I will turn it over to David. Thank you for the introduction, Liz. Uh, again, I'm David Liu, and uh, I believe this is the third webinar in the Tripwire Tips and Tricks series. And today, we're going to be looking at uh, MITRE ATT&CK and uh, five things to do with MITRE ATT&CK. As Liz mentioned, uh, I split my time between um, security research at Tripwire, where most recently I've been working on uh, secure configuration management in the cloud. Uh, so uh, creating uh, configuration policies in the cloud, uh, sort of our um, TE in the cloud, if you will. Um, and I also teach computer science at Portland State University. Uh, I teach intro to programming, algorithms, data structures, uh, theory of computation, and the ethics class. And as Liz mentioned also, um, before I came over to computer science and the tech world, I was an academic philosopher. And um, I still work on philosophy in my spare time. I have, um, well, my specialties in philosophy were in modal metaphysics and ontology. The latter, which you'll see, is relevant to the topic at hand. Before we get to uh, the content of the day, I want to remind everyone that there is a group chat. Now, I was trained as a um, philosophy professor, so when I give presentations, uh, I really like to do it in uh, the Socratic style, or when I teach classes, I, I like to use the Socratic um, uh, sort of method of a question and answer and discussion instead of just a pure, um, you know, passive lecture for the audience. Um, we all have experience and expertise to share. Most of you probably have more experience and expertise than I do. I'm just shy of my third year at Tripwire. So in relative terms, um, I'm new to the industry. Uh, questions, comments, and discussion are all welcome. I encourage you to use the group chat function here or use the uh, Q&A function. And you can also head over to the Tripwire forums for extended discussion. There is a, um, a thread that I've started in the forums uh, I believe it's under the Tripwire events area. And if you have to leave early, uh, here's a too long, didn't read, uh, and it's to adopt this taxonomy, that is MITRE ATT&CK, and do stuff with it. Um, so the one thing that can really support ATT&CK is uh, more users and more contributors. Um, taxonomies, and as we'll see, ontologies, um, knowledge bases, knowledge frameworks, these things don't do all that much on their own. And what they really require is a community to use them and to build upon them. That's where they start uh, becoming practical. So um, if you don't really come away with anything else. It's take a look at MITRE ATT&CK if you're not already using it, if you're not doing stuff with it. 
and start doing stuff with it. It needn't be the five things um, that we take a, a look at in this presentation. There's a lot of different stuff to do with attack. Does anyone recognize um, this person? He's a uh, Clifford Stoll. He's a well trained as an astronomer, and um, famously, he said, "Data is not information. Information is not knowledge." Uh, Clifford led one of the first um, cyber threat hunts that we know of back in the mid '80s. When he was working at, um, he was working as a sysadmin or um, in the IT department at uh, at one of the national laboratories. So he he discovered um, some German hackers that were in uh, that were in the system, and it was one of the first instances of uh, formulating sort sort of hypothesis and then actively engaging. The hackers, the attackers in the system, and then figuring out what they were doing. So, very much the first threat hunt. But you know, as security operations professionals, um, we have access to a mountain of data. There's all kinds of alerts and um, and logs, and there's just it's way more data than um, than we as humans can understand, right? Data being something like uh, the raw resources or raw materials uh, that's gathered up. Uh, it's unstructured, it's um, unorganized, um, it's unrelated. Uh, so that's what data is. Information is uh, taking that data and analyzing it in some way, uh, attaching relationships between uh, various raw pieces of data, um, structuring it, organizing it. Uh, that's something like information. Um, but information is not knowledge, where knowledge is something like um, understanding of the information or uh, something that we can act upon. That's knowledge. And so you can think of um, data to knowledge as something like um, data are the the, the most concrete, um, most granular facts. And uh, once you layer on top of that relations and uh, properties and attributes, uh, that becomes information. And then when you have enough of that to maybe infer other bits of information and allow you to make plans um, and carry them out, uh, that becomes knowledge. Data, when it comes to data, computers are king, but um, we as human beings, we live in um, a world of knowledge. Data is not so useful to us. And this is, um, next slide. So this is sort of the basis for formal ontologies. Here's an example of a formal ontology. It's uh, CYTO, the coronavirus infectious disease ontology. And you can think of an ontology as essentially um, sort of like a big graph where you have a bunch of objects in that graph and they're related to each other. You, you can see from this picture here that as an example, the COVID-19 disease process is caused by the SARS COVID-2 virus. Right? You can see that those both of those two objects represented in here, and then you've got a, um, you know, a directed edge between them, and that is the caused by infection with verb. Right. CYTO is a community-based ontology for coronavirus disease and knowledge, um, uh, for coronavirus disease knowledge and uh, data integration, sharing, and machine analysis. So an ontology is um, really a one way to represent our knowledge in a domain. And in the life sciences, in the biomedical field, ontologies, formal ontologies, that is ontologies that are put in a machine-readable format, 
Uh, these things have had so much success. They allow us to uh, find new um, new treatment strategies, uh, new drugs. They allow us to identify viruses much, much faster than before we had these ontologies. Again, the ontology is really, you can think of, as I mentioned earlier, something like a knowledge base, a knowledge graph. Um, you can think of a taxonomy as an ontology. All of these things, although if we get down to their technical definitions, they're, they're a bit different. They're not exactly the same, but the general idea is really the same. It is to represent all of the objects that we think exist in some domain, and then all of the representations that we care about, uh, all of the relationships that we care about between those objects. Ontologies um, haven't always had so much success. In fact, I, I think in every other field than life sciences, uh, ontologies have been tried and they haven't really panned out, especially in areas like um, manufacturing. And um, to give you a little bit of background from where I'm coming from, uh, I, I did my undergrad in philosophy at the University at Buffalo. And um, Dr. Barry Smith uh, is one of the philosophers there. And um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, he set up the Ontology Foundation and introduced um, the, uh, essentially the beginnings of the biomedical ontology. Uh, what almost every uh, every life science scientist uses these days. Uh, they catalog genes, they catalog uh, viruses, they catalog diseases, uh, and so on and so forth. And Barry Smith has a lot of thoughts about why ontology succeeded in the biomedical fields, but they failed in so many other fields that have tried to implement them uh, in order to get more efficiency in their processes and things like this. And um, Smith's conclusion is that, well, there are really two aspects to the success of an ontology. Um, one is adoption, uh, widespread adoption, and the other is um, interoperabil like, interoperability uh, between that particular ontology and other ontologies. So in other words, not having not enough people adopt the ontology is a key to its failure. And um, proprietary ontologies um, are another key to failure. Well, why am I talking about ontologies? I thought we were talking about MITRE ATT&CK. MITRE ATT&CK is, um, as the creators envision it, a taxonomy. And taxonomies really are ontologies. It's a subset. All right, a taxonomy is an ontology, but it only represents hierarchical relationships between the objects. All right, whereas um, this coronavirus uh, ontology represents, um, you know, some of these relationships are hierarchical. Is a could be hierarchical, or part of could be um, hierarchical um, by part, but um, occurs in, uh, caused by, may not be hierarchical. All right, so ontologies more generally can have non-hierarchical relationships between its objects. Okay, but MITRE ATT&CK is a taxonomy, right? self-admitted by the creators, and I think they um, would balk at me calling it an ontology. Again, if you come from the manufacturing world, you may be familiar with the term, and it may leave a bad taste in your mouth because of the failures. MITRE ATT&CK however, is situated to be a very successful ontology. Well, I said ontology, but taxonomy. And that's because it does great in those uh, two um, sufficient causes for failure. There is widespread adoption. MITRE ATT&CK over the last uh, couple of years has grown tremendously. Uh, if you're in... Um, the information security field, there's no doubt that you've heard of MITRE ATT&CK. And 
it's not proprietary. So MITRE, uh, um, nonprofit, is sort of the perfect organization to manage the attack framework. Um, it's, uh, I, I guess, I is it open source? They accept and um, welcome contributions from the community, right? And again, that is something that uh, on the um, positive side is what contributes to uh, an ontology succeeding. Uh, it's having a community that uses it and a community that contributes to it. Uh, another term for ontology really is controlled vocabulary. So if you really want to think of it from the linguistic side, there's basically two uh, fields that study ontology, and that is philosophy from the philosophy side and then also from the linguistics side primarily. Um, but it's got these two properties, widespread adoption and non-proprietary. So sorry to put a slide with such tiny font. I didn't actually want you to read uh, what's on here, but just to uh, see how quickly attack has grown, um, attack is again a taxonomy. It's hierarchical. Uh, it's basically represented by this table here. Along the columns, there are uh, is it fifteen? What are called tactics, and then uh, on the rows uh, are the techniques. It used to be, and I believe this was one of the guiding principles about uh, which techniques to curate into the attack framework um, was that the creators hoped they could fit the entire matrix or table onto a single slide. With some of the changes over the past year, uh, over, pa over the past year, uh, that's, um, that's no longer possible. As you can see, it's just, you can't make out what's going on on a single slide. Uh, so there are a couple of changes that contribute to this. One, um, they added, um, I believe it's three tactics to the original nine, um, and uh, a whole bunch of new techniques. And then they also incorporated uh, pre-attack, which was another a separate, originally separate um, taxonomy of how adversaries behave um, before the initial access phase. So uh, reconnaissance and um, developing resources. So those two uh, tactics, they are way on the left-hand side. Uh, those two were added um, into uh, what's basically a unified uh, table here. So MITRE ATT&CK, if you um, haven't heard of it, it is a taxonomy of adversarial tactics and techniques. It's a taxonomy of adversary behavior. So unlike security controls, which describes um, actions or policies um, or configurations that defenders can have to defend themselves against or to lower risk in certain cases, um, MITRE ATT&CK is trying to describe uh, how adversaries behave. So being a hierarchical taxonomy you have essentially two main categories of objects here. You've got tactics, that is the, the strategic goal that um, the adversary has in mind. For example, getting initial access into your system or um, executing their malware uh, or trying to uh, persist in your system through shutdowns, um, through reboots, things like that. So those are the overall goals. And then the techniques uh, really represent the behaviors. They are the how do the adversaries behave in order to, what actions do they take in order to achieve uh, whichever goal they're, they're looking at, execution, for example. So those are the main parts of um, MITRE ATT&CK. Let's take a look at one of the techniques because techniques really are the um, the main object that um, users of attack are going to primarily be looking at. And here's a page for one of the techniques. Uh, it's called modify registry. You can see that on the right hand side, there's an ID. There may be some sub techniques. That's something that was added um, about a year ago. 
and um, sub techniques are are again another hierarchical relationship to the techniques themselves. You can see what tactic uh, this technique is part of, what platform um, it's relevant to, what permissions an attacker would need to have in order to carry out this technique, data sources for how you might detect usage of this technique. Um, on the left-hand side, what you get is a um, just a plain text field uh, a description of the technique. Below that, you get procedure examples. And here are some of the other objects that attack has within its taxonomy. And this is why I say attack is really a sort of a beginning ontology and not just a taxonomy. It represents relationships that are non-hierarchical. So what you see down here is that uh, there are two pieces of software that make use of this technique. Uh, um, Agent Tesla is, is one of them. And you also see that there are two groups that make use of this particular um, technique, uh, APT-19 and APT-32. If I could scroll down the page a bit, um, there would be two other fields, um, a text field of how you might detect this technique, general methods, so not specifics, but general methods to detect whether this behavior is occurring uh, in your systems, and also a mitigation field. And these are steps that you can take to prevent the technique from being carried out. So that's the, the basics of um, MITRE ATT&CK techniques and uh, and and there's all these there there are some other objects within the taxonomy with or, or really within the framework uh, groups. So these are groups that have been uh, observed in the wild using these techniques. And attack is really a curated framework. It doesn't try to enumerate every attack. It doesn't try to enumerate every type of uh, behavior that an adversary can take but rather it tries to um, curate behaviors that uh, we've seen in the wild. And that is really why it's so important to contribute to attack. Uh, if you see behaviors um, and, you, and you, you know, have an incident and you figure out what's going on, you should um, see whether that's in attack already, and if not, contribute that information so that we can have a sort of community defense. So here are, um, we'll do this pretty quickly, and um, I don't re didn't really want to get into the details. As you can see, attack itself doesn't really have uh, what are called the procedure, um, I, I suppose I would call them the specifics, the specific procedures that are used. They have some examples um, for these techniques, but the techniques are a level of abstraction above um, the specific uh, actions, specific procedures that um, the adversaries used. So here are some, here are five things that you can do with attack. These aren't the only five things that you could do, and these are some very related um, activities. So we'll take a look at um, mapping security controls, driving threat intelligence, planning your threat hunting and incident response activities, um, using playbooks and sharing playbooks, and also using attack to teach uh, your workforce, or in my case, I teach my students using attack. All right, let's take a look at this first one. So um, here's a slide of the CIS controls. And um, security controls are essentially policies or procedures or safeguards um, or countermeasures that you implement to mitigate risk to your assets. So security controls that are mapped to attack provide uh, an important resource to the organizations um, in order to assess their coverage um, their, their control coverage against uh, threats from APTs. 
Uh, and they also provide you know a good foundation for integrating um, threat intel. So CIS has released a mapping from the CS, these 20 CIS controls to attack. There are other mappings. Um, somebody has produced a PCI to attack mapping. Uh, there are HIPAA to attack mappings. The Center for Threat Informed Defense has a mapping to um, um, uh, forgot which which mapping it is. Uh, the NIST um, uh, SP eight hundred fifty three. So they have a mapping from uh, NIST controls over to attack. And if you're looking at mapping these controls, well, I should say for all of these activities, um, there is a crawl, walk, run, right? There's a beginning level if you're just getting into it, uh, if you're just getting started with attack or you're just getting started with um, security controls. Um, there's sort of a beginner version, maybe where you're doing everything manually um, or, or you're just using um, open source mappings, um, you're using uh, things that other others have created already, uh, maybe a walk um, sort of intermediate level of doing these activities. Uh, you might be bringing in automation. And at the advanced level, the run level, you may be bringing in machine learning or AI, uh, ontologies, taxonomies, knowledge bases. These things are all foundational if you want to do good machine learning, good AI, good a, um, artificial intelligence based on uh, reasoning. Um, but so if you're doing these uh, mapping attack to security controls, the section that you want to focus on is, is not so much the techniques, but here it's going to be the mitigations. So there is a, um, a list of mitigations you can see this is an example. Um, uh, this is, oh, does this not show which mitigation this is? Yeah, I think I cut it off, I'm sorry. So, um, so this particular mitigation, uh, we could go find it in uh, the attack framework um, on the website. Uh, it mitigates these four uh, techniques, um, or yeah, these four techniques. So boot or log on, uh, auto start execution, uh, modifying the system image, uh, as well as two versions of its sub techniques, uh, network boundary bridging, uh, and OS credential dumping. All right. And that's because you're, why are you focusing on the mitigations? Well, it's because uh, your secu security controls essentially are mitigations. So you take a look at your security controls that you've implemented and you use um, the data here and uh, attack is available via um, GitHub. So you can, without too much trouble, automate some of this. And you can see per mitigation, once you identify which control maps to which mitigation and attack, then um, this table will show you which techniques that mitigation um, applies to. Let me show you an example of where we've done essentially some security controls or security configuration uh, mapping to attack. Uh, this is a screenshot of the TE attack policy. So we've got, and this is available in the Tripwire uh, customer center, uh, we've got uh, MITRE attack version eight. Uh, they recently um, uh, release an update to version nine. So we're going to take a look at that and see what um, what has been updated and if we need to change anything. But you can see here we've got um, uh, we've got credential access uh, protection. Uh, that's the mitigation M ten forty three. So that's the mitigation that we were talking about here. Uh, credential access pr um, protection. No, I'm sorry, I cut that off in the slide. But you can see we've uh, implemented 
uh, some tests that um, essentially can be classified as this particular type of mitigation, and then we can relate that back to the technique that it's supposed to mitigate. mitigate. In this case, T1003, OS credential dumping. So if you're interested in checking out uh, our MITRE ATT&CK uh, TE policy, you can download it in the customer center. Um, I should mention one more thing about doing this mapping. Uh, you may be tempted to use this as a gap analysis of your security controls and or your security coverage, but you need to be careful of that because, um, for example, we here have enable credential guard and that is uh, one kind of mitigation against OS credential dumping. However, there are other techniques that adversaries can use um, that uh, are you know can bypass uh, or aren't relevant to credential guard um, uh, for this particular technique. So just because you have a mitigation for a particular technique does not mean that you are um, fully covered against that technique, against opponents using that technique. Two, you can drive threat intelligence. So um, according to uh, Sergio Cal um, Caltagioni, uh, threat intelligence is uh, actionable knowledge and insight on adversaries uh, and their malicious activities, enabling defenders and their organizations to reduce harm uh, through better security decision making. So uh, I think of threat intelligence as trying to answer the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions uh, regarding the adversaries that may be targeting your organization. So who, if you're in the financial industry, um, who are the APTs, who are the state actors, who are the criminal organizations that tend to target financial? All right, what, and um, so on and so forth. But the attack framework is great for organizing your answers to the how question, right? These are the actual behaviors. How did they get into um, my networks? Uh, how did they persist in there? How did they um, exfiltrate data? Things like that. And, and that's how you might use attack uh, to answer one of those types of questions. Um, here I've got, you know, there's often three levels of threat intelligence. There's the strategic in very broad trends. There's the tactical, and you can think here, there's the attack te tactics and techniques at the technical level. And then there's the concrete op operational level where you want to know what tools, what specific procedures, what are the uh, indicators of compromise and other technical details. All right, so this is a uh, more concrete at the bottom of this triangle to more abstract at the very top. Attack fits very nicely if you're using it as a organizational tool uh, somewhere in the middle. And that's because attack really targets uh, that middle level of um, abstraction. So they stay away from the concrete. They want to um, infer from the concrete a more abstract uh, generalization, and that's what we use to um, build our knowledge. Threat intelligence, why would you do this? And it informs um, all of these areas. So in terms of security leadership, uh, for example, um, threat intelligence helps us prioritize our security resources. Um, for threat hunting, threat intelligence uh, helps us um, plan our hypotheses and experiments. So threat intelligence, uh, threat hunting and incident response are, you can do it well and you can do it very poorly. And one of the reasons why organizations do these things poorly is because they don't have a, a well thought out plan ahead of time. And here you can really think of uh, the attack framework as a map to help you plan 
some of these activities. So using attack to organize your threat intelligence um, really does make all of these other areas much more effective. So this is uh, David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain. And um, at the very bottom, you have hash values and signatures, which are trivial to both detect and for adversaries to change. And as you go up towards the top of this uh, um, hierarchy, uh, it becomes tougher and tougher. And so what the Pyramid of Pain is, how much pain do you cause your adversaries uh, in order to in order for them to have to change one of these things. Changing at the bottom hash values or signatures um, is easier than changing IP addresses, just easier than uh, changing domain names. And at the very top are um, the tactics, techniques, and procedures. So if you understand how your adversaries are behaving, um, you can put more resources into defending against those TTPs you can um, you can do targeted threat hunting against those TTPs and force your adversaries, force the people that are attacking you to change um, those TTPs, which is tough, which is costly. And that's what we really want. We want to make it costly for adversaries to attack us. Um, three, so... Um, if you really like sports, you understand that uh, in sports, at team sports, you have playbooks. And playbooks essentially, um, at least this analogy taken to uh, the cybersecurity world, uh, a playbook is an attempt to capture um, all of the TTPs that an adversary uses and to organize it in some logical or sequential structure. A playbook is essentially um, the entire campaign um, laid out in some kind of structure from the beginning to the end. And playbooks um, are useful for blue teams, for red teams, for purple teams. Uh, right? Im immediately, they're useful in uh, emulating uh, some particular attack. So having your red team uh, emulate an attack, uh, and, and you might use your uh, threat intel here, who is attacking you, use the, use their playbooks. And you can see, you can assess how well your blue team is. Okay. Um, but I really think the importance of playbooks is in sharing them. Right? Just to bring back how important it is to um, for taxonomies, ontologies, and, and, and knowledge bases, and knowledge graphs, uh, how important it is for a community to adopt them. So playbooks should be shared. All right. Uh, here's an example of a playbook. This is from um, Unit 42, uh, a research group at um, Palo Alto. And uh, you can see this is the playbook for uh, the Maze ransomware. And what they've done is uh, uh, they've... I'm giving you some options, some kill chain options. In this case, I've selected attack. And so what you have here is um, essentially all of the techniques that are used in the maze ransomware campaign uh, organized by the attack tactics. All right. Uh, again, sorry to throw up a slide uh, that's so small. Um, Font is so small you can't read it, but you can visit Unit 42's Playbook Viewer. I actually think they've recently changed, uh, and uh, instead of using playbooks, um, they are using what are what they call uh, atoms. So essentially, they they want uh, less emphasis on the linear linearity of um, a sort of playbook, where it's from beginning to end, but rather a more granular, uh, nonlinear representation. But in either case, whether you're sharing playbooks or atoms, um, this is a nice way to capture uh, it, the behavior throughout an entire campaign for some particular adversary um, and to share it with others. The fourth thing that you can do, uh, and I've already talked really about this, 
is to help plan your threat hunting and incident response uh, activities. These things work together. There's sort of a cycle between threat hunting and incident response. So uh, incident response is a, a reactive alert-driven activity. Right. So um, security teams really do need high fidelity data um, that allows them to triage alerts uh, more effectively, dismiss false positives, uh, escalate you know, the actual incidents, uh, and have clear plans for containment and remediation. A well-defined playbook can help do this, especially one that's um, built on the vocabulary of attack. Threat hunting, on the other hand, is a proactive, um, hypothesis-driven activity. And the idea there is to um, hypothesize about undetected adversaries that are already in your system, um, figure out what traces they could leave, what logs they could leave, what evidence they could leave behind, and then go seeing whether you, you can find those pieces of evidence. So what I have here, these two arrows, threat hunting informs incident response. Well, of course, if you find the adversary in uh, your system, then you've got an incident that you need to respond to. But incident, incident response also informs uh, your threat hunting activities. Right. So as you see what um, anomalies are in your system, then those should uh, inform what sorts of hypotheses you should have next. Again, the most important part of really having successful incident response and threat hunting um, programs is that you have really good planning. If you are just doing these activities without a good plan, then it's unlikely it's going to turn out well. And lastly, uh, you can use MITRE ATT&CK to teach. This is Bloom's Taxonomy. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, um, it is, I believe, the third triangle that I've shown you today. And um, again, hierarchical relationship. Um, but this uh, represents um, learning from the most basic type to the most advanced type. So at the very bottom, uh, you can have learning as just remembering recalling information, memorizing. Above that, you build understanding, right? So remembering could just be akin to remembering data, unstructured, unordered, uh, unrelated. Uh, you don't know anything beyond the, um, uh, you don't have any context to those items. It's the most basic part of um, learning. Uh, but above that, you have understanding where you start to make connections uh, you have analysis of um, the the specific pieces of data. Right? And you can see it goes, um, essentially, as you go up the triangle, you get more abstract. So being able to apply what you've learned, being able to analyze uh, what you learn, being able to evaluate uh, and make judgments about uh, whatever domain you're learning in. And uh, at the very top is being able to synthesize new knowledge about that domain. Um, so attack is a way of teaching uh, your, your workforce or students about how adversaries um, behave um, using Bloom's taxonomy, where it's not just, uh, here's a huge list of TTPs. Um, go down the list and, uh, and start memorizing. Um, or, or start trying to understand. Attack it gives you um, essentially a structure in order to um, to teach, and that's because attack again is at this middle level of abstraction. It's not down at the concrete level, um, but but it's also not at the the most abstract level. It's right in the middle somewhere, and that really does um, um, sort of get right at the middle of this Bloom's taxonomy as well. So analyzing, applying, understanding, that's what attack is useful um, as a teaching tool. And beyond MITRE ATT&CK, um, if you took a look at that um, COVID ontology 
in any detail, like the objects that that were in there. They're actually quite disparate types of objects. Um, and attack is 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 very con contained, right? It's specifically just about adversary behavior. Of course, there are these other things in there, like software and groups and mitigations. Um, but uh, attack is is very very focused, and it doesn't didn't look like that other ontology that I showed you. Um, and so, in the biomedical field, they sort of, I would say, built their ontology. Uh, from the ground up, from specific domains, they had the gene ontology, which was about genes, and they had um, the infectious disease ontology, which is specifically just about infectious diseases. Uh, and I think that's a a um, grassroots way, a ground up way, to develop and get people to adopt ontologies. You have a whole bunch of um, more concrete ontologies, more domain-specific ontologies, like attack, like this other one from MITRE. Uh, it's another taxonomy. It's MITRE Shield. Um, it's quite an interesting uh, uh, framework for active defense. And there are other um, security ontologies around, uh, or taxonomies. Um, case ontology is a digital forensics ontology. And the hope is that you have a whole bunch of these small taxonomies and ontologies and uh, knowledge bases that are being built up um, from the practitioners, uh, from the ground up, and eventually you can start connecting them, relating them to each other. So MITRE has a mapping between shield and attack. So, um, e and the mapping goes, uh, various shield techniques get related to various attack techniques that you could use to, for example, um, disrupt your adversaries, right? Active defense um, is about uh, collecting, containing, detecting, disrupting, um, and testing adversaries in your system. Right. So uh, there's this mapping between if you want to do active defense and you know the various ways uh, your adversaries are attacking you, what techniques they're using in attack, uh, you can use the mapping to figure out which um, of these shield techniques you might uh, plan to implement or plan to carry out. Um, and uh, what I would like to see, uh, uh, me speaking as the, the philosopher in me, is a cybersecurity ontology that is just as successful as the uh, ontologies in the biomedical fields. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Um, I hope this was interesting. I know it's a, a little bit high level. Um, perhaps uh, um, there weren't so many tips and tricks uh, but um, as a high-level discussion, I hope this was uh, informative for you. Um, you can keep the discussion going uh, at the forums at tripwire.com. And um, are there any questions? If you have any questions, you can stick it in the group chat or in the or in the uh, the Q and A module. And it's okay if you don't have any questions either. It's a lot to take in, um, uh, especially at um, at a higher level of abstraction. Okay, well, thank you everybody for attending. Um, that is all I have for you today. Thank you, David.
Uh, thanks for a great event, and thank you to everyone in our audience for attending. We hope that you found the, the session informative and useful to you. Um, I know we had a few people that joined late or had to leave early, so we'll make sure that everyone receives a link to the recording later today. Um, and, you know, as David mentioned, make sure if you're a member of the Tripwire forums and you have questions that come up later on or want to continue the discussion, you can do that there. Um, and then as well, if you'd like to receive proof of attendance today, make sure to respond to that uh, follow-up email so I can send you a certificate. As part of today's event, we are giving away three Tripwire swag bags to attendees of today's event. Um, so use my little random number generator. And we have um, our three winners are David S., Marco D., uh, Marcus D., and Tom W. So I will be reaching out to you all later this afternoon. Uh, we do hope that you'll join us for future tips and tricks sessions. You can check out our schedules at tripwire.com. So thank you everyone so much um, and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.